How you doing? My name is uh, Rick Fragnoy. I'm one of the owners here at Cleveland Palm Performance. And um, this is one of our big builds last year. And I kind of want to take some time and just go over the backstory about this car. I'm sure a bunch of you know this car, know the history of this car. But behind the scenes, there's probably a lot of stuff, maybe some stuff you never knew about the car. So we just want to kind of highlight some of that in this video and go over it. What we want to do when we were building a car was we really want to do an iconic kind of a car that everyone would know. But for our shop, we really want to ramp up a car do maybe a, a build above that maybe we hadn't done before. So with us, we want to go out and find an iconic car. I've been thinking about a Mopar, a Charger for a really long time. Obviously there's a 68 Charger, the Bullet movie, 69 Dukes of Hazard, 70, you know, with the Fast and Furious. So there's a kind of a Charger for each generation of people that grew up in that movie world. For me personally, the 69 was kind of the way to go. So with me, I wanted to go out and find a 69 Charger that was something that we can go and build, but also something that we just I don't know. It was a 69 charge we can go out and build, but also with what the car was, I didn't want to go out and take, you know, a true RT or some really nice car and do anything about it. So we tracked down a Charger shell in uh, Dayton, Ohio. It was a, uh, with a shell of men, it had no motor, no trans, and it had uh, just, you know, just a shell. So for me, it was really important that I want to keep the Mopar history with the car. So I want to make sure it had all four of the VIN body locations still intact, which would be the radiator support, the fender tag, obviously the main uh, VIN for the dash, and then the, uh, the VIN on the trunk drip rail. So we found a car in Dayton, Ohio that had been on the road since the mid-90s. It was a car that uh, we went down and looked at. You know the second you get ready to build one of these things, you know what you're looking at, and we knew this was the one. So we brought the car back in Ohio, and I just wanted to make sure when we were doing a car like this that we didn't completely blow apart what a 69 Charger was. We also wanted to do our modern take on it. For everyone that grew up in the movie world, you know, the 68 Chargers made famous by the Bullet movie. 69s were obviously Dukes of Hazzard, and the 70 was the Fast and the Furious movies. For me, the 69 Chargers is what spoke to me. It was something I'd thought about for a long time. Something that in my head I, you know, I'd thought about and doing. But with us and our modern drivelines and stuff we part, I wanted to incorporate all the Hellcat stuff into it. So for us, at the time, and it's still this day, there's not a lot of people doing it. We wanted to use an 8 HP 90 Hellcat automatic transmission. At the time, there wasn't a lot of shops using them, and even today, there's not a lot of shops using them. So for us, it was how do we incorporate the newer automatic trans that a lot of places weren't able to use or hadn't used yet, and put in a 69 Charger. So it's 2016. The wrecked Hellcats were very new to the scene. So we decided we'd start going through this. I said, if we're going to go build a car, I wanted to kind of give it our own take, our own twist. Let's do a body off car. And for lack of better words, this is very simplified. Take a body off one car, a body off another car, put it on top. Of course, much, much harder than that. And with our guys in here, I really want to showcase what our team could do, what our fabricators, what our body men, everything could put this car together because in the car world, a body off car is almost kind of frowned upon, um, kind of laughed upon. For us, I really want to go over the top of this thing and do it. So on our end, in my head, you know, I kick around. A car like this, we do a car that's built, a lot of them get named. It was important to me to name the car, so Reverence is where we came with our name. The reason I chose Reverence was I wanted to respect the heritage of what a 69 Charger was, the respect for the culture, what a 69 Charger was, what a 69 Charger was to the people that grew up with it, what a 69 Charger was to the people nowadays that know what that car was. Maybe we weren't old enough back in the day to grow to high school to 69 Charger, but we know what that car is. So Reverence was the name of that. I wanted to build respect for the car, respect for the heritage, respect for our shop. Basically, it's just about respecting the build and respecting the process. I think a lot of times out there, there's just too much blah, 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 garbage that goes back and forth between these shops. Anyone that's gone on and built a car of this level knows that it's just an incredible amount of time that goes into these things. When we started this car for the first probably two months, it was just a bunch of the normal internet troll garbage. Um, the car's never gonna get built, you know, this isn't gonna get done. This guy built it first, he did it better, she painted it better. Anyone that's ever built a car knows that every car out there has been built by someone else, period. It's just a fact of car building. It's your take, it's your artistic thing. So to me, when building a car, it's more of an art approach. So for this and this part, this was our shop, this was our vision, this is my vision of doing an art project. Obviously a much higher scale art project than we were you know, in elementary school growing up. So our build through the start to finish, we ended up um, 9,500 hours or so. And man hours and stuff, that's a ton of time. So with us going through it, we wanted to go through and make sure we hit everything. So the first two months, give or take, were pretty much, the car is never gonna get built, it's never gonna get finished, blah, blah, blah. So we are a mom and pop shop. So for us to go and take a build like this, financially, huge stress for this company to go through. For me personally, my brother I run the company with, my parents are still definitely involved with the company. 
big financial stress thing. So we knew getting this thing, once you start it, you got to finish it. And I was committed to the finish. So all the talk, all that stuff, I never once like, oh, did it, people have asked me, did it fuel the fire? Honestly, no, it didn't. Like anyone else getting a car like this, it was confidence. It was confidence in seeing it through. It was a drive in seeing it through. And any business out there, I don't care what you do, from a chef to a contractor to a kung fu karate instructor, you have to have the drive within you, within your team, within your people to finish the car. I knew that was never going to be an issue. But for us, because we're a mom and pop shop, we were doing a body shop expansion at the time, and we had to have the body shop expansion done so we could go through and obviously paint reverence, paint all our stuff we had going on. So a bunch of our main guys stopped, and we basically had to stop. We wired up our building. We did a bunch of stuff. We assembled our paint booth. We moved our paint with another thing. So it started to finish the build. It was probably 25 months. Yeah, actually. So it started to finish the build. It was probably just under two years. Probably came in about 22 months. We had a solid three months in there once we got going. We kind of stopped at a bunch of body shop expansion stuff. Got everything ready up for the final part of the build. Um, as the car started to come together... A big goal of ours was to get to Mopar Nationals 2017. We wanted to get Reverence in her metalwork and all that stuff to Mopar Nationals. So at the time we got Reverence driving, she was metal finished. Very cool looking, but very raw. Um, we went down to Mopar Nationals. The car was starting to kind of pick up a following. At this point, probably not that far into it. Maybe five months into the build. Maybe not even that far. But we had the body off. We had it connected. It was driving. It was running. It would stop. It had none of the finish work done. None of the interior was in, none of like the hard finish wiring was done. It was just a running, driving metal shell with a Hellcat motor in it. So Mopar Nats 2017, you go to these shows, they're really long hours. You get down there, you work in the middle, of, you basically work from before the sun comes up till the sun comes down at night. So you work the show from give or take eight to five or there before then. Afterwards, you know, you go out, you do some stuff. So there's a cruising that night. We go out to the cruising go around town, do a bunch of cruise shows. Car's still a really big response. We're really excited with where we're at with it. But, you know, finally get ready to sit down and eat. The joke is you never have time to eat. <laughs> you never have time to eat during the day. You never have time to pee during the day. Any of the guys and girls that have done these shows just know they're long hours. It's the middle of summer, as hot as can be. So we go out that night. We're sitting in a parking lot, probably 10, 11 at night, kind of on the outskirts of Columbus, Ohio. We got reverence and metal finish, and a couple of us just, you know, having a pizza, grabbing a beer, whatever, sitting in a parking lot. And we're sitting down there, we're kind of down off, you know, maybe off the highway a little bit. Um, where the highway, you can still see us, but we're kind of down a little bit off the highway. And we're sitting there, and you kind of, we're in this back parking lot, and there's only one way into the parking lot. And the car is kind of in the back, and we're kind of bottlenecked in. And we're sitting there, and a car comes kind of ripping off the highway and kind of comes, and comes back in. And he's kind of, you know, 250 yards away or something. He's not close enough. We can see his headlights, we don't know what's going on. A minute or two later, another car comes up. Then a third car. So at this point, we're like, ugh. I guess we're either getting rolled up on or the car is getting stolen. So all these cars kind of come in the parking lot at the same time. We're just kind of sitting there. The guy who's inside, you know, went in and grabbed food, drink, whatever. He's got the keys to the car. So at this point, I guess we're seeing this going. Like three of these guys hop out. And he's like, man, I'm telling you, it's reverence. It's down in this parking lot. you got to come see. It's incredible. And on our part, we were like, wow. It, it was incredible. It was almost flooring. So he calls his other buddy. He's like, I'm telling you, it's here. So like another car. So like three, four cars come in this parking lot. And at this point, we realize the car is starting to really have a following. It, it was honestly, it makes you smile thinking back on it. So that night, you know, there's a burnout contest going down. And um, maybe not the best part of town, but, you know, totally safe and everything. So we go there. And it's cool because when you get to this place, a lot of the guys with the bigger name cars, some of them didn't want to go to this part of town. We were totally good with it, honestly. I just like meeting people. I never worry about that stuff. It's all in the people, not the other stuff. So we take the car there, we pull them. There's this huge crowd. And we're like, yeah, whatever. Our car's in metal finish. There's all these really nice painted up finished cars doing burnouts. A lot of modern stuff, some older stuff. Um, a bunch of guys wouldn't go to the show with us because of the part of town. And we were laughing. Like, you guys are being idiots. Let's just go to the show. It's going to be awesome. So we get there at whatever, 12, 1 o'clock, pulling with reverence, and the crowd is like, it stops, and it's almost like a movie, but gets like a like a standing ovation, like a slow clap. And to us, we're like, what is going on? And they're like, you guys ran the burnout contest, right? And we're like, yeah, cars and metal finish, let's do it. So we have this big burnout on this thing. There's no back panels in the bottom of reverence. The trunk's not sealed off. So as we're doing burnouts, like all the smoke's just coming up in the car. You can hear the rubber and the rocks just basically dinging off inside the trunk and shooting all around. So we pull through, phenomenal. It's probably one in the morning. 
we're sitting there in this parking lot. I mean, it's crazy. On one hand, you have a guy who's got maybe three, four face tattoos next to another guy who's maybe a doctor next to a girl who's 16 next to an 88-year-old woman. It was the craziest blend of car culture I've ever seen in my life to this day in any show. And it was awesome because it didn't matter color, race, age, sex, car experience, anything. It was all about the car culture. There was a huge, huge response for reverence, but not just for us. We got to walk around and see. There was four buys. There was custom audio. There was TVs and like spots I've never even seen TVs mixed with muscle cars, with low riders, with lifted trucks, all ripping burnouts in an abandoned parking lot in the middle of pretty much off the road, not really in the cut, maybe an open business, maybe a closed business. And the response was just awesome. All the feedback we kept getting this whole weekend really told us that, hmm, this thing's really coming together. This is awesome. So as it started to go on, we come home from Mopar Nationals. I kind of realized, I kind of knew, but I kind of realized that this is, this is it. This car is becoming something. We know the whole goal the whole time was to go to SEMA 2018. Let's go to SEMA 2018. Let's make it happen. Let's ramp this thing up. Let's start doing a bunch of extra stuff that originally... Originally, I budgeted for four forty-five hundred hours in this thing, and as I said, we came at ninety-five hundred. So, whew. Um, <laughs> financial-wise, stress-wise, time-wise, money-wise, everything about it to get the car done. We were budgeting for forty-five hundred hours. We've literally doubled it. And yes, the SEMA crunch—it's real. And everyone that's done it, you know that a lot of times your hours don't get hit. So we kind of start rolling on the car, and probably call it mid-March, April. We start taking a bunch of social media videos. Every other week or two, we're doing videos with basically where the car is going updates. And each week or two, the car is just growing and growing. And we're getting responses back from people via email, phone, text, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. And everyone, hey, what are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with this? And it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And it was phenomenal. Our response was phenomenal. On the other end, we can't get into SEMA. I cannot get someone to take us to SEMA. So on this end, I have this phenomenal response, everyone coming in and doing this. The social media world loves this car. The real car world, not almost because it's a body off car, because maybe our shop name wasn't as known, been in business over 30 years, but like it was a weird mesh. So I was stuck between, I was on like this fence teetering back and forth with financially, do we finish this car? Do we stop this car? Do we go to SEMA? Well, heck yeah, but we can't go to SEMA. No one will take us. So you're trying to live this social media front where you're basically kind of living like the social media lie, which I'll admit it, shops do it. So I'm lying on, you know, on social media. The car's still getting built. Sponsor-wise, nothing. We couldn't get a sponsor for this thing for, we tried for a few months. I mean, by the end, it was laughing. We couldn't get a floor mat. We couldn't get an air freshener. And you're talking to these other shops, and, like, shops are taken. These are shops we know, shops we've sold drivelines to, shops I have a personal relationship, and I'm just cold calling guys I know, and I can call on their cell phones, call them at night or whatever. They're taking two, three, four cars, we can't get one car in. On my part, because I'm here, I'm proud of the team, and maybe I'm a little too invested in the car. I think it's just crazy that this car can't go to SEMA. Like, it's mind-blowing to me. It's like, so these things called SEMA Town Halls and stuff. So there's one around the area from us. We take the car. It's much further along than Mopar Nationals. It's in metal finish, but a ton of the metalwork details are done. Like, I'm not going to go over all the stuff we've done so much, but, like, the headlights are working, the hood's done, the doors are done. So much of the car is done. The exhaust is done. We go up to this town hall, and uh, we towed the car up there. The only one that took a car up there to the town hall, and we unload the car, and the response, once again, is awesome. It's a, uh, a well-known shop around here. All the true car guys are coming out there loving this thing. It's going great. Talk to a couple of the higher-ups, you know, at the SEMA town hall, great tube of base. They're like, and I'm like, man, so once again, I'm like, this thing isn't going to go. So we're starting to push that May, June. We're ramping up our hours. Guys are starting to kill. I mean, the SEMA crunch is real. Everyone's done it, you know. Overtimes, weekends, you know, everyone's missing kids' soccer games and stuff. And as it goes, the more tired, the more everyone's stressed. The guys get everyone from our office to, you know, the painters, the fabricators, the mechanics. Everyone's getting stressed about this car because it's what happens. And this was a shop build that so much of our shop was involved. You know, a lot of shops say this was involved, this was involved. Every single part of our business was involved in this. From people ordering the parts to people bring in the parts, people crane parts to go out of here, to bring parts back in. Um, every single part of this was involved in this, and everyone's realized how much is riding on this. We still can't get into SEMA, so 
we're starting to get stressed. Well, the social media videos are, at this point, we're doing more and more. They're taking off more and more. So on one point, we're just, you know, luckily blown up on social media. On the other part, we're going nowhere with SEMA. As the SEMA crunch is going on, myself, some of the guys working in the office, we're starting to realize that sponsorship, we can forget that. Um, it's not happening. We've it literally exhausted every avenue. We spent a couple of months on it. We just don't have the connections. We don't have the name, whatever it is. We can't get sponsored. So we're back to work on this, you know, trying to get into SEMA again. And it's funny because, like, on one level, you're like, man, it's so crazy. Yeah, no one could, like, get sponsored. But then it became, like, another part. It's like, you know what? Whatever. We're just going to finish this car. I don't care about sponsorships. We're going to do what's for us. At first, I was like, I wasn't, how do I say, I wasn't angry. I definitely wasn't because I get it. Everyone has, I, I don't sponsor. I barely sponsor. I do two, three sponsors a year. So I'm not angry about sponsorship. It's crazy when I saw a bunch of other stuff getting sponsored, how much other people had everything from their build being built from sponsors. So on our part, I was like, well, that's not going to happen financially. The car's just got to go to SEMA. So, you know, I, my other owners, we committed to getting this car to SEMA, but we had to basically shut off customer work the last two months. So it became really financially taxing. But this whole time, we don't have SEMA locked in yet. So finally, I mean, if called July 31st, and I cut off dates July 31st, Luckily, Cook's Exhaust on North Carolina took us. And I mean, it was phenomenal. It was a lifesaver. It was great. And it's funny down the road, you find out maybe we probably weren't even the first two choices with them. But at this point, we know the car is going to SEMA. So it's a huge relief off our back. It's still, you know, end of July, August, we got to finish the car. Everyone, you know, the shop was great. From start to finish, put in the hours, we finished the car. But obviously, I keep going back to SEMA Crunch, but it's real for everyone who has done it. We were beat, dead, tired. So a little behind the scenes stories, we're going out there, we're driving out to SEMA and we're human. So we go out there, have some family in Colorado, we stop in Colorado, see the nieces, see the nephews. Driving through the mountains, everyone says, hey, make sure you fuel up before uh, Utah. No problem, fuel up. Um, we were working with a small media company at the time, they had some recording stuff in the truck. Um, going into Utah, we're hauling you know, a 40 foot trailer with a diesel truck going straight uphill with you know, reverence in it. And 100 miles out of the next town, you could realize we ain't gonna, we ain't gonna make it. So you're watching, you know, 75 miles, 50 miles, 25 miles, and so we stopped put, you know, the fuel cans in the truck, and we realized because everyone's so tired, our fuel cans for the diesel are basically still sitting in Ohio, and we're in Utah, so it's whatever one in the morning. We're dressed like it's you know summer out, 80 degrees. Well, from Denver to Utah, the temperature drops from whatever 80 to 40, so. You know, <laughs> so stupid. So distance to empty has basically been zero on the truck for the longest time. With, you know, it's saying 15 miles from town. I don't want to leave, obviously, the car to sit on the side of the road. So we pull over. We go off down and down ramp. We're in the middle of nowhere in Utah, middle of nowhere. Um, so it's myself and uh, two guys from the shop that built the car. And we're basically, each of us is walking up a hill trying to get cell phone reception in our shorts and t-shirts in 40 degrees, no reception. Um, OnStar on the truck, so remote, no satellite signal. I'm like, what is going on? And then once again, the stress of the car, and you're like, ah, this is happening again. I can't believe this is happening, it's so stupid. You know, I got three, four, five gallon fuel cans sitting back at the shop. You walk out of the shop door, they're literally sitting there. What do we not forget? Fuel cans. Would we walk out of the shop and forget whatever four in the morning we left? Fuel cans. Being tired and being human, but it happens. So we go into basically <laughs> laughing but idiot mode. So we're in the truck and we're layering up extra t-shirts, extra shorts, because we can't get the truck moved. So we don't really know how far away we are. We're give or take 15 miles from town. The truck's been empty forever. Distance empty's been zero. The gas gauge's been buried. My concern was because we're in Utah in the middle of nowhere and we're going downhill that we run out of fuel literally in the truck and basically the truck and the trailer are on the highway from 2 to 8 a.m. I could walk in town, but you're still walking middle of the night. Not the best idea. So, you know, we're kind of because we all get along, but at this point everyone's stressed and tired. We're all fighting with each other back and forth. Um, a semi-truck pulls off on this weird overpass or underpass around, sorry, and pulls up like a mile in front of us. So. Me and one of the other guys walk up to the truck. I'm trying to tap the guy's truck as we're walking up so we don't freak him out. And basically, the truck and the guy's super freaked out because, like, in the middle of nowhere, he didn't even see us. We have no lights on the truck. <laughs> basically, the dude thought what was going on, but he wasn't cool with it. So he's really sketched out. He's basically get the away from my truck. Um, I'm like, listen, man, we got to be in Vegas. This is the biggest show. For us, this is a big deal. We got to get there. 
like run me in town that's 10 miles away i'll give you 100 bucks nah I'll give you 200 bucks like what will you seriously drive me off i'll get my own ride back dude's like no i ain't helping man puts the window up, like basically get that away from the truck i'm like oh what's this dude's deal so we go back to the truck now at this point we're just laughing the whole thing's ridiculous so we're laying up extra t-shirts we're gonna sleep in the truck for the night the dude must have had a little bit of change the heart and about you know 45 minutes later comes back he's like i'm not riding you guys in town not anything to help you but basically it's straight downhill from here it's 11 miles not 15 make your guys own call we start the truck go up the hill basically literally get up the hill we use the way of the trailer and the way to reverence to push us all the way down the hill get off the on-ramp and i like, literally run out of gas like i mean in the on-ramp it was so funny like at this point we're close to the gas station get in there fill it up keep moving but i mean it's just the behind the scenes stuff we're human it's totally we have this car we put our whole thing into basically for 19 months of a build and actual build time and we run out of gas cans i mean come on or fuel cans um so we get into vegas we're there getting there on time um anyone's been to sema knows behind the scenes it's crazy in there the union guy is doing a phenomenal job but they're setting up stuff everywhere there's forklifts running over toolboxes cars banners going up in the air there's just it's chaos it's organized chaos so because obviously they have a ton of stuff set up our moving dates run a little behind so we're parked at the airport in uh, Vegas at one of the side lots, okayed with my everything. We have a truck and a trailer. Well, because we were there for whatever, a day and a half before, we're using the truck in and out, run luggage, you know, go grab food, do whatever it is, run out, look at some stuff. Well, the trailer obviously stays there the whole time. So the only thing that we worked with the guy at the airport says, basically, each time you come out, get an in and out ticket for the truck and the trailer. No problem. So we're paying our in and out each time. Well, the trailer obviously never went out. It just only went in. So we'd been in and out of this lot, I don't know, nine, 11 times over this, you know, two day period, no issue. The day we go out for SEMA in the morning and SEMA, you know, I forget we were in Battle of Builders and moving time was Monday at one o'clock, whatever it was. Um, so you gotta get the car in there. Well, then you gotta go to this, you know, this, I forget what it's called, a marshaling yard. You gotta go to the marshaling yard, get a ticket, get that ticket in the marshaling yards, whatever, 15 miles out of town, then you gotta come back in. And all this stuff's happening. Well, now our moving spot's gonna get missed. Like, so once again, the SEMA nut thing. So we're back at the airport trying to get the car out, and there's a woman working in the airport, and she's giving me the hardest time on this $8 unpaid parking ticket. And I'm like, literally, the trailer hasn't come in and out. We've been in and out every time. We've bought nine tickets since then. It hasn't been an issue. Well, you guys, whatever, this ticket's, you know, all oh, you owe me. Lady, we're talking about this car and where we're at this time and all of the overtime and all stuff. It's eight bucks. Here's 20 bucks. Keep it. No. Da-da-da-da-da-da. 50 bucks. Well, that's what a lost ticket is. Back says lost ticket's 48 bucks. Here's 50 bucks. We got to get out. Well, now they want paperwork and where I've been to all. Some basically has got someone who's just having a bad day. Well, so I'm getting in and out of the car, you know, five, six, seven times. And I got all the stuff in a backpack and all my paperwork. And there's probably the seventh time I go to get in, one of these got the harnesses in there. The harness must have fallen out of the door. And I shut the door and I chipped the paint off the bottom of the door. And this is hours before SEMA, like two hours before SEMA. I lost it. Like everything from coming in, I was beside myself because I'm getting screwed around over an $8 ticket. I have all this paperwork showing I paid for, and it was bananas. So in minuscule looking back on the chip was so small, I couldn't even tell. But to me, because you've been part of this building all these hours, all this stuff, you want to seem to be perfect. And it was just the whatever sets you over the edge, and I've lost it. So... <laughs> Basically, I'm like, Bruh, what is going on? SEMA's happening. The manager gets on the phone, looks at the camera, and he's like, oh, my God, like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I don't know. I didn't pay this $8 ticket that I paid. They open the gate. We go there. Well, at this point, because we lost so much time screwing with that, we can't trailer our car. So now we're driving into SEMA. So the whole thing was just one of those things. Once you get in there, no one ever knows. It's on. But it's all the stuff that happens in these cars. You talk to the other guys and girls out there that build these things, it's just what happens with these things. So for us, we'd been to SEMA, we'd been there walking around. This was my first, our company's first time bringing a car out there. So was I nervous? Yeah, a little bit. I think it's human nature. After everything you know, you start to get some doubts and stuff in your head and you start to come in. You know what this car is. You have faith in what your guys can do. You have faith in every bit of your process, your design, your ideas, your quality, your execution. I'm completely over the top and going through and checking over stuff and doing stuff. My guys are too. So I knew the car stood up there, but also you're coming into a place that's a big worldwide show with a bunch of national people and national, there's media, there's people from all over. So yeah, there's a pinch nervous. 
So the first couple hours in there, um, it's, you know, funny story too. So um, Graveyard Cars, the painter, Will, comes by and I'm talking to him. You know, for me, I've, you know, watched his work, but I never talked to him. Well, I have the keys in my pocket. Seema, you can't start these cars. Well, remote start, every option on this car works. <laughs> and talking to him and boom, car starts in the middle of it. We're an hour and a half into Seema. I just started the car and Seema, you can't start. That's like immediate, like, kicked out of there. So like everyone's cool around. They're like, what car started? They're all like, I don't know. But just another story. So I'm like, what could possibly go wrong with this? This is just going so bad. Um, and then very early into that too, they do this video where basically they come around and they want to, you know, get you in front of your car. And there's a Camaro in their booth, really great shop, guys out of Alabama. Their owner, they built a car for someone. You know, the camera gets in front of you, hey, you know, blah, blah. This is Rick from Cleveland Pound Performance. And I want to thank all of my sponsors. And they basically, it's for SEMA, I believe, your YouTube channel, whatever. So, you know, the people in front of me, the Camaro, they have 30 sponsors. Well, I don't even know what video I'm taking, so I had like a five minute notice. So I get in front of the camera guy's got the camera here. And he's like, you know, just see. So I'm like, hey, this is Rick from Cleveland Pound Performance, brought 69 Charger Reverence. You know, honored to be here. So pumped Cooks had us. Thank you very much, Cooks. Love being here, Cooks. And like he puts the camera and he's like, who's your sponsors? I'm like, I don't even know what video we're doing, man. I don't have any sponsors. The guy's like, you don't have any sponsors. And he shuts the thing off so the video never aired. But I'm dying laughing because we're just going in this so blind. I don't know what we're doing. So at this point, I'm like, this is just going south. Um, and then about four hours into it, the car just took off. And it was phenomenal. The response was phenomenal. We had just crowds around the car, people around the car, celebrities around the car, videos. And you could just tell, and it was like such a relief. Like, I mean, obviously the car wasn't sold yet, but you knew financially, you knew design-wise, you knew build-wise, you knew quality-wise. In the time the hell I was coming out from Dodge, we didn't actually know it was getting unveiled. We kind of had an inkling, but you didn't know it was anything to cover. A bunch of, you know, the higher-ups from Dodge, some of the executives, those guys are coming over and like, hey, this car is killer. Sweet. That's awesome to hear because it's coming straight from the guys that designed a car or Dodge for this show. Then a bunch of celebrities are doing stuff and you know you start booking them some stuff. We we do a magazine shoot from Opar Collectors guy we set up. Um awesome, phenomenal. Shout out the airport. Talented photographer, um great shots. Shoot another talented photographer for Hot Rod. I mean Hot Rod magazine kind of you know the creme de creme of the magazine. And you're like wow we're shooting for Hot Rod. This is this is pretty legit. It's pretty awesome. And, um, you know, afterwards the car, ended up, we were in two national calendars coming out next year too. So all that response, it validates you, but you feel great about it. But after this, you go out to these shows at SEMA, you go to SEMA McKnight, the night show and stuff, and you start doing this. That's when you start meeting all the real people, you know, all the people that have been following this thing on social media. And, you know, it's an honor to meet all of them and get to see them in purse. And they, they go over their details of the build and the stuff they love about the build and their favorite stuff. And it's so cool to hear from them because maybe one guy likes the hood. One guy likes the headlights, one girl likes the taillights, someone likes the modern interior. But on our part, the people were so entrenched with the car, they really knew what was going on, so it was phenomenal. We go to, you know, give or take eight, nine shows. We're doing kind of that Midwest, Chicago, Detroit, Columbus, Syracuse, you know, Akron, Ohio. We're doing all these shows, you're getting these great invites, you know, Texas, Florida, Nevada, back to Nevada, you know, bringing out to Oregon. And the car's still traveling really well. We're meeting a ton of other shops, spend some time with these other owners, these other techs, really getting enmeshed in the industry with guys that a lot of times I've only known, like basically just the owner, one person in the shop. You're meeting all their crews, the guy that tows it, the guy that paints. So it's been a phenomenal tour. So, you know, the debate is with these cars is how far is the tour? Where do you go? Do you go to a major auction? Do you go on the show tour and then just kind of sell it off to the side? Cars like this, and you know, anyone that's watching this, that's built these things, they're hard to sell. You have so much money in these things, and yeah, I get it. We probably never get back what we have in them. But for the advertising for the shop, that was the whole goal of this, and it worked, and it worked phenomenally. So the debate is basically, let's keep going. Let's keep going on some more show tours. Let's take it through winter. Let's do some more spring tours. Let's pull up for sale in summer 2020. Let's get the most we can out of this. And then we had an incredible opportunity to go worldwide with the car and kind of falls in your lap and you know, you're like, go worldwide, the car, it's crazy. But just like the way I look at SEMA, sorry, 28 years ago when I ever started, whatever it was, I know some of the guys are at the first SEMA, the second SEMA, they've kind of been able to stay on those coattails and stay through it because of their hard work and dedication, but also because they were there when it started. 
So for us, when we heard of a show in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, I'm like, whew. So we get this opportunity where Syracuse Nationals and um, basically it's like, hey, there's this incredible opportunity kicking around. There's this new kind of SEMA like starting up, you know, worldwide. And you're kind of like worldwide, like what, what's that mean? You start to find out it's in Riyadh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And you know, at Syracuse, it's, the word kind of trickled out a week or two before, but it was still really early in development. And you know, you start kind of, you guys going, have you heard about it? And you know, I always like a new thing. I'm not gonna lie, I've never been to the Middle East. I've learned online of the culture, but I don't speak Arabic. I'm not 100% confident in my Saudi culture. I'm not gonna lie, I've never been over there, but I love to meet new people, I love the opportunity. So yeah, I, I was interested. What's cool is by the time I got back that late Sunday from the show, I had an email basically saying, well, you know, the interest, let's put this thing together. And, and I was interested. Um, so we got on the show very early and I think it's an incredible opportunity. And to me, it's crazy because this whole long drawn out story. And if you had told me 24 months, 19 months when this build was going on, Vegas, SEMA 2018, that reverence's final chapter is going to be in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Oh, I wouldn't have bet a million dollars on it. Now that I have a million dollars, I wouldn't bet a hundred dollars on it. But the part is, is that's what's been cool about reverence. Reverence has been such a cultural phenom on our end. It doesn't want to sound concerning, but it's just the honest approach. We've been able to meet so many great people through social media and also going to these shows that it was, it was flattering. So now it's, let's go do worldwide. Let's go over there and go do basically a new version of a SEMA show. But let's go do it in a country we've never been to. Let's go do it in a culture that we've sold to and in a country that we've shipped to, but we've never personally been over there. Let's take reverence over there. Let's start doing this. So once we had the opportunity, I knew we were going to go to Riyadh. You know, we have, you know, some connections over there. Not a ton by any match, but, you know, you kind of start feeling it out a little bit. And I'm not going to lie, I was excited to go to Riyadh. So I figure out how are we going to go to Riyadh? I want to make sure that reverence, just like reverence has had such a great following in the U.S., but reverence has had 19 months of build time, almost two years, plus all these shows and stuff. We're kind of coming into Riyadh a little bit, um, how do I want to say, we're coming in a little unknown. We don't have that giant name of some of the other shops going, so it's how do we make sure Reverence is out there and Reverence is known in Riyadh? So, you know, we kicked around some of this stuff and uh, we started working with a uh, you know, production company out of Illinois, um, NPD Media, and uh, the owner of that, Nathan Destro, um, is really something that we kind of came together, kind of started kicking some stuff around. Nathan's a buddy of mine and we kind of, you know, I grew up with Nathan. Um, we have the same passion for the work ethic, but obviously he's very into the film stuff. He's traveled abroad and done all this. Obviously, I'm very into the car stuff. So we've always kind of kicked this around, but uh, talk about him shooting a couple cars for us. I'm 38. He's your younger. We've never worked together. I mean, we've been friends. We've just never worked together. So his company and stuff, and I would never pick because he's my friend. I picked because he's professional. I said, reached out to him, and, you know, NPD Media was posting together. So let's do some crazy photo shoot for this thing. All right, let's do some photo shoot. And the way I work, I'm like, you know what? No, nah, I don't think a photo shoot's gonna do. Let's do a video shoot. He starts kicking around. We're like, I'm like, I want to do a movie trailer. And he's like, I love it. Let's do a movie trailer. So we basically went around Cleveland for a couple days, and obviously everyone in Riyadh, Cleveland Power Performance. We're from Cleveland, just like you guys are proud of your hometown. I'm very proud to be from Cleveland. I can't wait to go over there and meet all you guys. So this is our version of reverence basically coming through Cleveland and doing um, a couple movie shoots with MPD Media that we're going to be happy to show. And it's going to be our movie trailers to basically show everyone reverence in Riyadh. And as these trailers come out, we have a bunch of footage on the car, a bunch of stuff we're going to be promoting over there for you guys. And uh, we got about a two-month promotional thing going on. And I look forward to meeting everyone over there. And um, it's going to be some great footage. So you're going to have two months of watching some awesome videos of this, uh, awesome videos of reverence. And then uh, reverence is shipping out here pretty soon. This is our last weekend with reverence. Then we'll be over there in uh, Saudi Arabia once it gets there. All of our social media will be over there before we get there, but I look forward to meeting everyone. Uh, you know, final closing loop on uh, Reverence, too. It's crazy when you build something like this. Maybe I'm weird because I look at stuff in a, maybe an art way or a different way than something else because I have a passion for it. Reverence is almost like a child to me. Y you love your kid. Boy, your kid can frustrate you at times. There's times your kid can really frustrate you. There was a time last July, I mean, I was just having like a little mini crisis meltdown. I was like, bah, pick it up, throw in the dumpster. I'm done. Scrap it. We're done. Obviously, that wasn't going to happen, but sometimes you just got to walk away and you got to diffuse the situation. Just like with your kids, sometimes you just got to walk away and calm down. Of course, we love our kids. They're our family. They're our blood. Reverence in an indirect car way has become our blood, our family. So much of my company is invested in what Reverence has become. Everyone's invested. It's not just me. Our shop. 
our team, our crew, they all have a stake in Reverence. So for me, like next week when Reverence leaves, it's almost like crazy because it's like raising a kid to like 18, sending them off to college. You've been with them every day. You, you know them in and out. You know what they like, what they don't like. You know, maybe a little scratch here, a little tickle there, whatever, but they know, you know in and out because you're almost symbiotic with that stuff. I've been with Reverence so long that it's like basically sending a kid off to college. But also when you send that kid off to college, you're excited. That kid's going on a new journey. That kid's going on to meet new stuff. That kid's going out to, you know, whatever, grow its wings and spread and you'll fly and all that stuff. And that's what I look at with Reverence. Did I ever think Reverence was going to end up worldwide? No. Did I ever think Reverence was going to end up in Riyadh? No. Do I think that's awesome because that's how life works? That's how the journey of Reverence has been? Yes. Um, thank you, everyone that's part of the build. Thank you, Riyadh, for having us. Um, I'm not going to lie, I'm excited. I've never been to anywhere even close to the Middle East. Um, I had to get a new passport for it. Um, haven't been out of the country in probably nine years. Um, yeah, am I excited? I sure am. Um, so I'm excited to be coming over to Riyadh. I'm looking forward to meeting everyone. I'm looking forward to seeing the culture. I'm looking forward to basically just seeing what's different from Cleveland, Ohio to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So thank you for watching this video. Thank you for following Reverence Online. Thank you for the social media, the Facebook, the Instagram, the YouTube, the emails, the phone calls, our open houses. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you girls. The response has been phenomenal. Thank you for coming out to the show and just saying, hey, thank you for watching the build from day one. Thank you for every bit of your feedback, every bit of your responses, meeting us at shows, coming up and talking to us. And honestly, we love feedback. Maybe you're, you don't like the color of the car. Maybe you don't like something else. That feedback's important to me. So thank you from the start to the finish. Maybe you came in the build late, maybe you came in the build in the middle, but everyone's stuck to the end and I appreciate that. Obviously we got a ton of great stuff going on. We always have customer work going on in here. Our next big build gonna be coming is gonna be Aberration, our uh, 56 Viper truck, and we you know, encourage everyone to follow along with that. But thank you and thank you everyone for following Reverence. We got big things coming up and um, Aberration will be our next truck and all of our customer cars will be online as well.